Well, it looks like we're holding steady now. So those that are late, hopefully we'll be able to view the recording later posted on our website. So welcome to everyone that is attending. My name is Autumn Shook. I work for the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Lodging Program. Thank you for joining our ninth of our web, a monthly webinar series presentations. It is titled Grocery Stores and Food Safety. Here are some quick housekeeping points if you've never joined us before. <laughs> Otherwise, this is totally the same that I've read every month. Um, all of the participant microphones will be muted throughout the webinar, so you don't have to worry about your microphone being picked up. Uh, you may submit questions during the presentation by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We do encourage questions to be typed in during the presentation um, as your questions come to mind. You don't have to wait. Uh, regulatory considerations covered today are those only applicable to the, those operating in Kansas, of course. Today's session will be recorded and posted online. And after this session, you will receive an email with a link to the recording and the resource materials that we refer to. The email will also contain a link to a survey and your ideas that you share will be considered for future outreach webinars. Um, now on to our speakers. So today we have Brad and Brody. They are from our food safety and lodging program to speak today. Let's get started. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss food safety within a grocery store setting. My name is Brad Holgraver. My colleague is Brody Phillips. And today we will be discussing grocery stores and food safety. Brody and I are both food, drug, and lodging surveyors in the state of Kansas, otherwise known as food safety inspectors. Many people ask us, what areas do we look at in a grocery store? Well, we look at all areas, but some of the larger areas include produce, raw meats, deli counters, and salad bars. Now let's dive a bit deeper into some of these areas and talk about the safety measures that we assess. First, let's discuss the fresh food held behind the counter. These include both hot and cold foods that have been opened or prepared within the grocery store setting. For our discussion, all the temperatures today will be measured in Fahrenheit degrees. So food served hot should be held at 135 degrees or above, and cold food should be held at 41 degrees or below. If these foods will be held longer than 24 hours, they will need to be date marked. Date marking is important to limit the risk of foodborne illness listeria. The symptoms of listeria can differ from person to person, but for pregnant women, they will typically experience only fever and other flu-like symptoms, such as fatigue and muscle aches. However, infections during pregnancy can lead to miscarriage, stillbirth, premature delivery, or life-threatening infection of the newborn. For people other than pregnant women, their symptoms can include headache, stiff neck, confusion, loss of balance, and convulsion, in addition to fever and muscle aches. All ready-to-eat foods must be properly held and served for no more than seven total days. Proper date marking can include one of three options. One, dating each food item with the date they were prepared or opened. Two, dating each food for the day it is to be discarded. Or three, dating each item with both open date or prepared date and the discard date, the recommended method. Please make sure you have a written process in place and that all employees are using the same date marking process. Deli counters, such as those that hold deli meats and cheeses, must be maintained safely. This includes maintaining all foods in these displays at 41 degrees or below, as well as using proper date marking. As we just mentioned during the previous slide, date marking is required on all open ready to eat foods that are held cold over 24 hours. I would like to mention that there are a few exceptions to date marking, such as hard salami, hard or semi-soft cheeses. If you have any questions regarding whether a food is exempt from date marking, please reach out to your local inspector. Located at most deli counters are slicers for meat and cheese. 
These are large pieces of equipment that can be difficult and time consuming to break down and fully wash, rinse, and sanitize after each use. Many stores choose to clean this equipment in place. When cleaning in place, you will want to follow a few simple rules. One, turn off and unplug all equipment using any locks and applicable tags. Two, remove food and dirt from under and around equipment. Three, remove any small parts that come off and clean and sanitize them following standard procedures. Four, wash all surfaces that can't be removed with a cleaning solution followed by a rinse with clean water. Five, wipe or spray all parts with the sanitizing solution, making sure your sanitizer is at the right concentration. And concentrations can be determined with the correct testing strips. See label for the correct contact time. Six, allow all parts to air dry. And seven, put equipment back together and re-sanitize all surfaces you touched. This procedure is completed in regular intervals to minimize the risk of listeria and biofilm and should be followed at a minimum of every four hours while the equipment is in use, then broken down and fully washed, rinsed, and sanitized at the end of each day. Later in this presentation, we will provide you with the link to this poster. Some grocery stores have a salad bar that consists of multiple items being held for the consumer to build their own salad. Some of the things that we assess at a salad bar are, one, temperature control. One of the many issues we see is overfilling the containers of product. Most containers have a fill line that shows the maximum amount of product that can be safely stored in these containers to allow the salad bar cooler fans to circulate cold air throughout the system. By overfilling the containers, we are not allowing airflow to maintain temperature control. Also, stirring thick salads and soups at a regular interval can help maintain temperature control. Two, date marking. As we talked about at the deli counter, most of the items on the salad bar require date marking and should not be held longer than seven days. Three, food replenishment. When replenishing the salad bar, be sure to not mix products prepared on prior dates. If this is a procedure you use, then the date of the oldest product becomes the date of all the products. Four, utensil cleaning frequency. Since many people are using utensils, it is essential that we are cleaning or replacing the utensils at a frequency of four hour intervals or less. And five, sneeze guards. Sneeze guards are required to help control contamination from the public while they prepare their salads. Next, let's talk about meat counters. This area provides many different options from raw to fully cooked products. Some of the things that we are looking for are cross-contamination. All products in the display case can be segregated by cooking temperatures. Chicken, 165 degrees. Commuted meats such as hamburger and tenderized meats at 155 degrees. Whole muscle meats such as steak and roasts at 145 degrees. And seafood products at 145 degrees. Another way to organize the meats is the silo method, separating each raw animal food by type of food meaning beef stored with and above beef and chicken stored with and above only chicken. We also recommend that seafood be stored separately due to it being one of the main eight allergens. Temperature control. All products in the meat display case should be held at a temperature of 41 degrees or below. This would include all ready to eat food as well as raw products. Date marking. All products that are ready to eat and packaged on site would require proper date marking and need to follow the seven day rule. Last, I'm going to talk about meat grinding logs. The USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service, FSIS for short, regulates the record keeping of beef ground in retail stores. 
This image is an example of what FSIS requires all retail food establishments that grind their own meat. This record or log includes the date and time of grind, where exactly the meats come from, such as their product code, supplier number, and retail label information. The purpose of this documentation is to aid in traceback investigations should a foodborne illness outbreak occur. Now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Brody, who is going to talk more about cold holding. All right, thank you, Brad. The first thing I'll talk about today is temperature control. <clears throat> Proper cold holding is important in a retail setting, not only for customer safety, but also quality of product. Potential cross-contamination is also something that should be addressed in retail cold holding units. We want to prevent the possibility of raw products such as ground beef and eggs from contaminating ready-to-eat items such as produce or deli meat. Solid dividers between types are ideal and considerations should be made to be sure that the product is not overflowing these dividers and contacting adjacent items. Verticality is also important as we do not want to have raw items on a shelf above ready-to-eat items. When utilizing planograms or a map of where to place products, be sure to be aware of any raw to ready to eat contamination issues that may arise. So tied into that is going to be the monitoring of your cold holding. Active monitoring is a critical aspect of successful cold holding. As a retail operator, it's your responsibility to be sure that you're selling a safe product to your customers. That can be hard to do, however, if your reach-in fridge is only holding at 62 degrees. While the Kansas Food Code does not have a requirement for frequency of monitoring, daily checking and logging is strongly encouraged. As mentioned previously, 41 degrees is the maximum temperature allowed for cold holding, and potentially hazardous food should be kept below that at all times. The type of displays your establishment uses should also be considered. For instance, an open display bunker that is heavily stocked with salad mixes will struggle to maintain temperature compared to a reach-in display with well-sealed doors and adequate airflow. Ideal ambient temperature for refrigeration is 35 to 38 degrees and at negative 10 to zero degrees for freezers. Finally, it is important to not rely solely on monitoring equipment such as integrated thermometers as instruments can fail or become uncalibrated. Periodic checks with calibrated probe thermometers should also be a part of your monitoring strategy. Cross-contamination should be prevented by properly storing food in your coolers. This ties into cross-contamination mentioned on a previous slide. Ready to eat food stored above raw animal foods and lowest required cooking temperature items should be above higher cooking temperature items, such as steak above chicken breasts, as seen in this picture. Remember the silo method that Brad also mentioned where raw animal foods are separated by species. So another item we check is product receiving. Food must come from an approved source in particular when placing orders with a new vendor. We have encountered many different foods while inspecting, such as pizzas, salsa, jerky, that turned out to be from an unlicensed supplier. Be sure when placing orders with a new vendor that they have a food processor license from the Kansas Department of Ag or other relevant jurisdiction to ensure the safety of your product and customers. It is also important to inspect your orders as you receive them, which includes temperature and visual checks to ensure that products have not been temperature abused or otherwise contaminated. Product deliveries are also a potential vector for pest infestations and should be checked for pests of public health concern. So we'll talk a little bit about produce safety. Whole unprocessed produce does not require temperature control for safety. Cold holding could increase the quality of lifespan, however, and help limit the growth of molds. When inspecting produce, we look for adulterated foods. These are foods that are not safe to eat due to being severely bruised, discolored, rotten, or even moldy. For most people, mold is not harmful. However, outside of blue cheese, most people do not want mold in or on their foods. 
if you're going to slice the produce prior to selling it, like you would with a watermelon, you must rinse off the outside first, limit bare hand contact while cutting, and use proper packaging and date marking. So now we'll talk about sushi counters. Sushi counters are becoming increasingly popular, but there are several things to keep in mind. Sushi rice is often kept at room temperature because it is easier to work with when making rolls and the like. Cooked rice, however, is a potentially hazardous food and should be time and temperature controlled for safety. Acidifying rice with vinegar is a common practice to allow it to be kept safe at room temperature. If this is being done, however, an approved HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point Plan, needs to be on file and pH logs kept. If you do not already have one, our head office can help you plan and approve an appropriate HACCP plan. Once the sushi has been made, time and temperature control still applies and the product should be cooled quickly. Sushi counters often use open display bunkers to hold their product, but these are less than ideal for cooling a product that is not already at 41 degrees. Rolls and the like should first be cooled in a walk-in or other appropriate method before placing in display bunkers. Finally, since some sushi is technically classified as sashimi, which means it contains raw fish or meat, care should be taken to not contaminate dishes that only contain ready-to-eat ingredients. Since sushi is made by hand, hands should be washed and gloves changed when moving between types. Any products that contain sashimi should have raw ingredient labels and a consumer advisory. Now we'll talk about canned foods. One of the biggest concerns with canned foods is the risk of Clostridium botulinum, or CBOT for short. CBOT can grow in environments where oxygen is limited. CBOT is the causative agent of botulism, a severe food poisoning characterized by double vision, paralysis, and even death. Clostridium botulinum bacteria is usually found in improperly canned foods, especially home canned vegetables. However, it still can be found in commercially made canned foods. Severity of canned dents and the can's integrity may signal there's something wrong within the can. Shallow dents on the side of a can are not typically of high concern. That being said, special attention should be taken on cans that are swelling or leaking, have severe dents, dents across the lid or side seams, or accordion-like creases where it's vertically smashed. Customers typically will not pick a damaged can, but aisles should still be checked so that damaged cans are removed and disposed of or returned. When evaluating the severity of a dent or the integrity of the can, please keep these tips in mind. Does the dent impact a seam? This could be on the top, bottom, or side seam. Does the dent cause sharp corners in the sides of the can? Is there a product leaking from the can? Or is the can swelling? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you should discard the can for everyone's safety. As you can also see, the picture in the middle where one can, though it is severely dented, is also missing its label. In a retail setting, such as a grocery store, variety store, or even a convenience store, you also may not sell unlabeled canned goods. We will add a link to Afto's pocket guide for canned defects. So now we'll move on to food storage. While doing inspections, we also check your storage rooms. Food storage and display safety in retail settings is mostly concerned with preventing contamination. Steps should be taken to prevent contamination from the environment the food is stored in and other items the food might be stored with. For example, we don't want jugs of motor oil to be stored on a shelf above bags of sugar. Food should not be stored directly on the floor. This is to prevent potential contamination from things like regular cleaning and mopping or heavy foot traffic. Keeping food off the floor also helps to protect food from pests. Although most people know us as food safety inspectors, our official title is Food Drug and Lodging Surveyor. Many people inquire what the drug and our title means. It is within the Food Safety and Lodging Program's jurisdiction to monitor the sales of over-the-counter medications or drugs. What we're looking for is the manufacturer's expiration date. 
This date is when the manufacturer has determined that the drug may not be as effective as intended. In return, we ask that retailers no longer sell these items. While they are often contained in the same area, the food code does make a distinction between medication and other items such as herbal supplements and multivitamins. Items that are not FDA approved to treat an illness or condition are considered food by the food code and should be protected as such. Finally, all over-the-counter medications must have English labeling in addition to any other language labeling to be legally sold in Kansas. So as we wrap up today's presentation, as a reminder, we are recording today's presentation. We record all of our presentations and earlier, David and Robert, two inspectors in southeast part of Kansas, discussed controlling pests in food establishments back in May. Then in June, Michelle and Tara Jo discussed how hand washing is the best defense in limiting the spread of foodborne illness germs. To learn more about pest control, employee hand washing, and other ways to limit the spread of germs, visit our Food Protection Task Force website to watch previously recorded webinars in their entirety. The link will also be provided in the chat. There were many posters used in today's presentation. You can find these and other useful food safety posters at statefoodsafety.com. These posters were not developed by KDA and KDA does not have any control over their content or their training materials. So I hope you found the information we covered today helpful. If you ever have any questions about food safety in your operation, please feel free to contact your local inspector. We're always happy to help you operate both safely and successfully. If you don't know your inspector, contact our Manhattan office and we can connect you with their inspector in your area. You'll also find educational materials on our website to help you with all aspects of food safety. And now I'll turn it over for the question and answer session. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Russell Plaschka with the Department of Ag here in the Ag Marketing Division, assisting with the Q&A. Uh, we did have a couple questions. Uh, the first one, and I may go with, um, well, Brody or Brad, either one here. Uh, the question was about the temperature on cold food storage. If that temperature rises above 41 degrees, is there a time period before they need to discard that product? What's the kind of the protocol there? I can take this one. Um, you know, once the food rises above 41 degrees, we really want to get it down, back down to 41 within a four hour time period. Um, and just making sure that um, we use any options we have available to maintain that temperature control. So. And then also kind of a follow up there on the thermometers. Is there is there a certain number that you have to have per so many square feet of cooler space? And where in that cooler, high, low, medium, you know, where should they be placed in those thermometers? Um, I'll grab that for you. Um, you. Adam or Autumn might need to remind me if there's a requirement for space. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we want to be careful about not necessarily putting uh, monitoring thermometers like right in front of your, your blower, if that makes sense, because that's the coldest part of the fridge. We want it to be in the warmest part of the fridge. So that will generally be generally the spot that is furthest away from the blower. Um, usually that's a good idea to be, um, you know, I guess in a retail sitting that's gonna be, you know, close to the door of the reach in fridge. Um, you know, is going to be a better place to put it as opposed to, you know, in the back or on the top shelf. And then I got a question here. Uh, this might go more toward Adam or Autumn, but uh, it's a question we frequently get at KDA. If I'm a grocery store owner and I want to buy from my local produce producers, those that are producing some fresh produce, what are those licenses or permits that they need to have? Thanks, Russ. It's a great question. Uh, if the 
through the local business, we encourage folks to find local sources whenever they can and support all those all that goes with that. Uh, but uh, produce generally does not have any additional requirements if they're buying that directly from the producer. Uh, if you're doing processed types of foods, that generally requires a food processing license. But whatever the questions that might come up about whether a license is required or not, we'd encourage you to reach out to us. We'd love to work through those scenarios with folks and help make sure that they're, they're getting that safe local food whenever possible. And then we had one last question come in from Deborah that asked about the meat slicer that you brought up in the presentation. Did you say the meat slicer should be cleaned every four hours? Yeah, Russell, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, it goes along with, with that temperature control issue that we, the other question we had at the beginning, it's that four hour time limit. We really wanna just maintain all foods ready to eat um, at uh, 41 degrees or below or 135 or above. And so if always when we're using a meat slicer, there's gonna be particulate, there's gonna be a buildup of that biofilm that we talked about. Um, and so much by making sure that we clean these every four hours, we can limit the risk of listeria uh, um, in that situation. So yeah, every four hours. I'll, I'll just tag on there, Russ, real quick that if, the slicer does happen to be located in a, a refrigerator room, like in a meat department that has refrigerated space. There can be some extended uh, cleaning intervals all the way up to if it's below 41, that can be cleaned once every 24 hours. Very good. Well, um, feel free to throw in some more questions there, folks. But uh, gang, that's, that's all the questions I have that's come in. So thank you very much for allowing me to help out. Adam and I are trying to swap our mics here, so forgive, forgive me. Since we don't have any additional questions, which we had a small group, so um, sometimes this is your chance to get your questions answered. Um, did I see one? Another one just came in. Um, the question is, if did you answer, slicer, I'm sorry, the one from Beth? Yeah, did you see that? If your meat slicer okay, isn't so used Okay, so it says if often. your meat slicer isn't used often, how often should we clean it? So if you, um, I'll answer that since I already have the mic anyway. Um, if you don't use it often, meaning if you're not using it once a day, I would clean it before you use it and clean it after you use it. So if it's that infrequent, you're gonna wanna clean before and after, which is somewhat challenging. Um, but the four hours is if you're constantly using it, that would be a maximum. So we would encourage you to clean it more often. Um, so that way, if you get in a rush and you can't clean it at four, you don't um, go over. Um, so hopefully I was able to answer that question. I don't see, and the slicers are really hard to clean. So honestly, the more often you clean them, the easier it is to clean them um, and you get really good at it. So then, sorry, I'm stealing your thunder, Russell. Do you want to? <laughs> okay, great. You're good. I'm just go confirming that whole unprocessed produce does not require temperature control, but it does help the quality of so. Our, oh, Adam was typing the answer. Did you type it? Boy, we're just like a hot mess here on this Monday. <laughs> okay, you got it? Okay, so I guess I don't know where you would read that. Boy, I'm like showing my <laughs> bad technical skills here. <laughs> That's correct. Okay, that is correct. Apparently he wrote that somewhere, although I don't see it. Boy, I hope someone else is challenged it like me, so. It shows up under the answer in the middle of that path. So. He said, thanks. Okay, great. <laughs> I think we're cool. good to go. See what an interesting group when we have few people. So we really do, it is 3.30. So this is kind of what our cutoff is, but if there are additional questions that come up later, we'd love to answer them. Um, you can call us, you can email us, whatever is most convenient for you. I'd like um, to thank you for attending today's session. And again, it's recorded. And so you're going to be able to view it on our Food Protection Task Force website. Um, and then also just to put a little plug in for next month, we're doing one on holiday gatherings and you're thinking, really, it's already pumpkin spice time, but yeah, it is. Um, so we wanted to get ahead of the November Thanksgiving holiday. So at the end of next month, we're going to be talking about, about those gatherings and, um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Look for a survey that's going to immediately follow this webinar. So that way you can help us plan on future outreach webinars. Thanks again.